I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is John Hurdle, the executive chairman at Hurdle Callahan and Company, a $20 billion outsourced CIO business he founded in 1988. Hurdle Callahan retains the distinction of initiating the OCIO model that's flourishing in the market today. Our conversation covers leadership lessons from John's experience in the Marines and at Goldman Sachs, the genesis of the idea to create Hurdle Callahan, the structure, culture, philosophy, and execution of their investing, John's outlook on emerging markets, the economy, private equity, and credit, and the concept of governance alpha. John has a gift for distilling the investment process into understandable frameworks and analogies that we all can use to communicate with our many constituents. Today's sponsor has in mind a fascinating way of getting your attention on an investment opportunity. Manny Friedman and EJF Capital are so passionate about the future development of the U.S. through qualified opportunity zones that he asked me to find a way to urge people with taxable capital gains to take a closer look at these investments. The government came out with the next round of regulatory clarifications on April 17th, and we now have answers to frequently asked questions that may have prevented investors from diving in previously. EJF has a fund that's investing in a bunch of projects across the country. But Manny's sponsorship isn't about his fund specifically. It's more about getting the word out so this innovative government program can be successful. The incentives for taxable investors in both real estate and new operating businesses in opportunity zones are massive. And if the program scales, it has the potential to transform economic development for the better in a way that may be bigger than any of us can envision. So that's it. Manny's trying to spread the word and get smart folks to pay attention and find investments in opportunity zones. EJF's fund is one possibility, and there are plenty of others too. But please take a look if you haven't already. If you want to learn more, have a listen to my podcast with Manny about the opportunity zones. It's episode number 91. And one last note. You may remember my very different conversation with psychologist Michael Mervosh about the hero's journey. I've attached a replay of that episode on the feed. Start listening right at the 20-minute mark for a discussion of the journey itself in the mountains of West Virginia. If you're intrigued by the hero's journey immersion experience, now is a great time to sign up for this year's men's or women's summer journey. You can find out more at heroesjourneyfoundation.org. Please enjoy my conversation with John Hurdle. John, great to see you. Great to be here. Always a pleasure. Well, why don't we dive in on your background? We can go kind of all the way back to the military. Yeah, well, I spent seven years in the Marines and wouldn't swap it for anything. It was a great experience. People say to me, thank you for your service. I always say, thank you for paying me. I just had a wonderful experience. What were the most critical lessons you took out of that experience? First of all, it's this notion of reinforcing the notion of idealism and high personal standards and that there's almost nothing you can't accomplish. This is a key to being a Marine, and I'm sure not just a Marine, but any high-performing organization. When you're in training, every day they would give you a task that you thought you couldn't achieve, but they knew you could if you pushed yourself. And then when you achieved that, that was the point, right? They were raising the bar to a level that you thought you could not achieve, but they knew you could. So you achieve it, and then you achieve the next one, and then you achieve the next one. And at some point, you start thinking you can do anything, and then that's when you become a Marine, that there really isn't any obstacle you can't overcome. Most people under push themselves. So whether it's academically or physically, you can do a lot more than most people realize they can do. And the Marines are not interested in potential, but it's got to turn into kinetic pretty fast. Potential that stays potential, they're very blunt about it. It's not really any use to them. So I think that notion of action and results and high personal standards and idealism and teamwork. And I think teamwork is something you don't see as much in society today, more and more focus on the individual. But individuals don't put a man on the moon. So the great things are accomplished by teams. And what were the key 
leadership lessons. You, you know, you come across former people in the military, especially the Marines, that just have this training that you don't often see in the corporate world. The first thing you start with is this notion of leading by example. So as an officer, I always thought that if I could live up to the other Marines' expectations, that I had to become a better person. So it's just this notion of personal standards and leading by example. That's basic. That's foundational. I think of that as to be. You have to, who are you? What's the integrity that you bring? And that's the first part of my framework on leadership, which is to be, to see, in other words, have a vision that compels people, and then to serve. So once you have people who you are leading who agree and are excited about the vision, first of all, they trust you because of your personal integrity. Second of all, you articulate a vision that they are excited by. And then the third is, how can I help you be successful and root that shared vision? So to be, to see, to serve. And I think that was a model that, I don't know that the Marine Corps articulated it that way, but it seemed very obvious to me. Are there others that you still hold today from that experience? First of all, very lucky and fortunate and grateful about being an American. And the notion that citizenship is a responsibility that we all have. And what does it mean in the 21st century to be a citizen in a society that is as diverse as ours is. And so when you become a Marine, you take an oath to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and so forth. And when you leave active duty, you don't untake the oath. So that notion of compelling citizenship and what can we do, I just read a great biography of Lincoln called Founder's Son. And he felt very compelled to move the experiment of democracy forward. And I think more of us need to think about that, that this is still an experiment, and we have an obligation to our country to move it forward. Seven years go by. Did you think of staying for your career? Or what well, was you the... know, I didn't really think of it that way. I thought I'd stay as long as I was having fun. So I just wanted to be a Marine, and I didn't really think about career. I, I earned a regular commission, which is something that honored graduates get when you come out of training. So I could have stayed forever. But I also got married and had a baby, and the idea of being the first guy on the beach— didn't see quite as responsible as it once had. <laughs> One of the things was I was sent on recruiting duty, so I was recruiting officers, and I was away from most of the other Marines. And the best part about being a Marine is being around other Marines. So I was sort of halfway out the door and went on recruiting duty and went to graduate school, and, and I was thinking about, hmm, you know, what should I do next? And I heard that you could make $100,000 a year working on Wall Street, but you couldn't get a job. And I thought, hmm, I don't really know what they do on Wall Street, but I'll bet I can get a job. You know, it's sort of one of those things, and that's how the transition happened. So you end up at Goldman Sachs, and what was that early experience? That's your first corporate experience, first Wall Street experience. It was terrific. I feel very, I mean, I keep acting like, you know, well, that was great. It's true. I feel like I've been relentlessly pursued by good fortune. I was at Goldman, and, and Goldman's a wonderful firm, but I personally think, and I know they're more profitable today and so forth, but that that was a golden era for Goldman Sachs. It was run by John Weinberg and John Whitehead, but other leaders like Bill Groover and Roy Zuckerberg and Richard Menchel and so forth. And, and Whitehead and Weinberg were greatest generation World War II veterans. John Weinberg was a Marine. So it was just had a tone of professionalism and client centricity. And remember, Goldman was very much an investment bank. So it was relationship driven. As opposed to later on, and like I say, it's still a wonderful firm, but when the J. Aaron people took over, it became more trading focused. And so when I was there, it was still very much relationship driven. So that was the fundamental culture. John Weinberg used to say a couple of things he said that stuck with you. One was that there are three things you have in business, people, capital, and reputation. And of the three, the hardest to replace or once damaged is reputation. He also used to say that some people grow and others just swell. So <laughs> those are words to live by, yeah. you know. So he set the tone culturally, tremendous professionalism and rigor on learning your craft, which was the, put a lot of effort into training. Bill Groover, who later became a professor at Bucknell, but he ran the training program and you sat on every desk and you learned with the practitioners and you didn't leave the desk until they thought you knew enough and you also establish relationships with all those professionals so that once you got in the field, you could call back and have a question. So it was good. We used to have meetings that started at 8 o'clock on Friday evening. Well, <laughs> that sounds... <laughs> I don't think that happens too much today. No, not that much. Not that much anymore. So how long did you stay at Goldman, and what was the impetus for starting Hurdle Callahan? I was there six years, 82 to 88. 
And while I was there, I just, as I said, had a great education. I was close to the head of research. It was a guy named Bill Keeley. Lee Cooperman was the strategist, but Bill ran the department, and I was close to him. And I was curious about real money management. Because in those days, it was a simpler world, stocks, bonds, and cash, U.S. I was a broker. We had people talked about a lot of the divisions later, like PCS and GSAM and there were basically bankers, traders, and security salesmen, you know, brokers, and I was a securities sales guy. So the good news is I was a generalist. I mean, really, I, I was in option strategies. We sold fundamental stock research, municipal bonds. I mean, it was all over the place. So the training was really spectacular. But what happened was while we were there, I was able to cover lots of different accounts, including one particular internal investment office at a family. And the family was the R.K. Mellon family, the R.K. Mellon branch of the Mellon Bank family. And I believe in those days it was the foundation and the family. And the chief investment officer was a guy named Arthur Miltonberger, and I covered him as a broker. And what was interesting was that they were consistently outperforming us. So Arthur, who was based in leafy Ligonier, Pennsylvania, which is really a bucolic setting, was outperforming Goldman consistently. And that really baffled me. And if I take a step back, the day I showed up for work, my mentor, Bill Groover, I said, ran the training program. I said to him on the first day I was there, what's the noble cause? And he had been a submarine officer, and I was a Marine, so he knew I wasn't kidding. And he didn't say, what do you mean noble cause? This is Wall Street. (laughs) He said, the client is a noble cause, which is a great answer. So I said, okay, so off and running and trying to do well by the client. And In spite of ourselves, because we were all trying hard, I felt like we were disappointing the clients. And when I saw Arthur Miltenberger outperforming consistently, so it wasn't just once in a while, it wasn't random, there was something going on there. Uh, I really was drawn to that because if the client was a noble cause, I need to have the best system to make sure we didn't disappoint the client. And that's really where the beginning of Hurdle Callahan came from, was emulating the independent investment office. How do you create a multi-billion dollar independent investment office? And when you got started, did you have an anchor client on day one? Nope, we had no clients. And part of that was that Don Callahan and I had both had great experiences at Goldman and we didn't want to take any Goldman clients. So philosophically, we didn't want to do that. Second, we actually didn't have a solution set up yet. It was very early on. We had a joint venture that helped us get started with SEI. And Al West was very kind to us and helped us get started. And it was about a year before we had our first client. Other than independence matters, and if you can do better in leafy bucolic Pennsylvania than you can on Wall Street, maybe that's a good thing for the client. How did you think about kind of the core investment problem? Well, structurally, when I think about any performance-oriented organization, I like to think about structure. Culture is part of that, but structure, culture, then philosophy, and then execution. So if I think about a sports team, I think about how are the New England Patriots structured? How does their draft work? How does their comp system work? How is everything? Then what is their philosophy? What is their philosophy of offense? What's their philosophy of defense? What's their philosophy on special teams? Then there's execution, right? You still got to catch the ball. You still got to look off your receivers. You still got to do that thing. And what I think a lot of people, they conflate those. And of course, the fourth thing is luck, you know, random outcomes. And what we want to be able to do is look back and say, how do we optimize our decision making? How do we set up a system that allows us to make better and better decisions with high probabilities of success? So when I looked at Arthur Miltenberger's model, it was a structural thing first that I said, wait a second, this guy can cherry pick best in class managers from around the world. And he's got three and a half billion dollars of purchasing power, which is a lot of money today, but it was even more money in 1984, whenever we looked at this for the first time. And so we said, how can we emulate the structure? Now, he also had top-down dynamic allocation. So he not only had better security selection, the metaphor I like to think there is no matter how hard we worked, it would be like a decathlete. You know, we were trying to do 10 things and he had 10 specialist athletes and I'm competing with 10 specialist athletes. So no matter how good I was, I couldn't do that. So his security selection was better than ours was. And in addition to that, he had a disciplined process for managing risk on top of that. So dynamically shifting among the specialist managers. So that fundamentally is a better structure. And we haven't gotten into philosophy at all, which is a separate issue. But structurally, we wanted to replicate the, what I would call the indisputable advantages of an independent multi-billion dollar investment office structure. Those two pieces of structure 
the specialist managers, easy to understand. You're one shop being broad to Kathleen at Goldman. You are a sprinter. You're going to find the sprinter, the high jumper, the long jumper. What's the structural advantage of dynamic asset allocation? Because a lot of the models you hear about don't include that as a component of their strategy. Well, you and I have been in the business a long time, and it's an ongoing battle to decide whether you can add value by dynamic allocation. And where I am on that is that you can, if you are careful when you do it, and you respond to very strong signals. So it may happen once every 10 years, but if you can avoid a bubble by doing that dynamic asset allocation, it's hugely impactful especially in our world where we're managing serious money for families and for endowments and foundations and pension funds. The first rule is don't lose the money. And so how do you lose money? You walk into a bubble. So you've really got to have a sense of where the value is. And when within like one standard deviation, one normal where values are kind of normal, you probably can't add a lot of value through a dynamic shifting of, of allocation. But it's part of the process. And so if you have that disciplined process for risk management, because the thing is, with most specialist managers, they believe that their asset class is good no matter what. I always say it's like asking a potato farmer what's for dinner tonight. There's going to be potatoes on the menu at some point. So you really have to have a broader view to say, yeah, this guy's great at what he does. So what he does right now is getting a little pricey. We'll dive back into that dynamic allocation. So shift over to philosophy. What are the core tenets of what you believed about investing? Well, it's evolved over the years. It's hard for me to reflect every point of it other than we believed in specialist managers. We believed in patience. We believed cost mattered. So we didn't want to overpay. That's an ongoing lesson. We see that all the time and we talk about that more. But And we wanted to have custom solutions. That was the other thing is that every client, you had to solve for that client's needs. And I think it's true in any case. We use medicine as a metaphor a lot, because as long as someone's healthy, the money's very important. Once you get sick, the money becomes less important. (laughs) But while you're healthy, it's really important. It's that significant. It's that serious. So when I look at wellness, wellness is different for every person. And so that was another key notion. Custom programs, open architecture, wholesale access, just put it all together as a program. It's sort of like, once again, using that sports metaphor. It takes a lot of parts to make the program successful. So fast forward to today then, that's obviously evolved over the last, whatever, 30 years. What are the key components of your philosophy, what you believe about investing today? We start with the notion that the law of active management, skill equals success times the breadth of your opportunity set. And I think this is underappreciated. In that simple algebraic equation, Success equals skill times breadth. So breadth is just as important as skill, as long as your skill isn't zero, right? So while everyone out there is trying to get more skillful, including us, if we can maximize breadth, which we should be able to because we sell no products and we have lots of purchasing power, that's an edge. Now, that doesn't mean we invest in everything, as you know, but we want to look at everything. So maximizing breadth. So we really start with the notion that most people need to have equities in the portfolio because it's the only way to provide enough return to offset their spending requirements and inflation and taxes for families. So you start out with sort of the all-country world index, a max, the widest, broadest index you can. And then you say, well, how do I improve it? Well, the first thing you do is you put something in there that dampens volatility. So you get a higher port. And this is very basic, but I like to think of it in terms of a building block Because this is one of the other key things is most clients don't really understand how real investing works. They understand maybe how buying a stock works or a company works. But putting together a total solution is not something that most clients understand. So if we can lay it out in an uninterrupted chain of compelling logic, this is what I think about when we hire money managers. And I want to think about it with us too. What is our chain of logic compelling? So maximize the breadth of an equity set. How do I improve on that? I dampen volatility with some income assets. And then I want to put in some things that are diversifiers. So right there, I've thought about three framework, a taxonomy, growth, income, diversifiers. So I want to put everything into that category, not by product name. I don't want to think about what the world calls them. I want to think about what it does for my clients. And then I keep thinking about improving that. How do I improve it? For example, might I weight the equity indexes differently? 
before I really get active. It's a systematic active. Instead of weighting them simply with capitalization, might I weight them equally? Might I weight them in a way where I just simply try to get away from the ones that are going to go bankrupt? You know, some kind of a simple way to weight the benchmark differently than capitalization weighted. We call that systematic active. Just on that, where do you come out? Well, today we're still focused on factors. We think there are some sustainable factors that add value, like valuation and momentum and quality. Size is a little more questionable in our opinion, but we're still looking at factors all the time. We're always saying, is it working? Isn't it working? And, and the, the jury's out a little bit. We've been doing this for about 20 years. And that's a long story too, how we got to that. We were really trying to measure long only managers more effectively. So we started to create a custom benchmark for every long only manager that really was made up of the first five screens they did before they picked a stock, which we thought defined a subset or a, a, you know, a micro beta. And once we started measuring them against that, we said, you know what, their alpha is much less. So it's much less downside, much less upside. So if I'm measuring a great high quality or a earnings momentum growth manager against the Russell 1000 growth, I get a lot of variability there. And if you say to that guy, tell me how you pick stocks, and he says the first thing he says is, well, I pick the top half by ROE, return on equity. Well, he just excluded 50% of the benchmark. So is he really being picking in that benchmark? So it's that kind of a notion. We did that because we wanted to be able to give the manager more money when he was at the bottom of his cycle. And we wanted to show that he hadn't lost his edge. It's just that his subset was underwater. And so he was fine. And that's why we did that. So that was 15 or more years ago that we started using factors. And we're still looking at factors. But I would really think about it as factor weighted as another weighting scheme. And so we want to look at all kind of weighting schemes. Families, it's a little different than institutions because inst a lot of these factor weights like momentum and valuation and quality are pretty heavily traded. So they're not as effective for families as they are for institutions. So that's the first level is how do we enhance the broad market exposure? And then the next one, which I think is something that I feel really good about is concentrated long only. And I really think there's a tremendous disservice that has filtered into the endowment and family investment world that came out of the pension world. And, you know, in 1974, when ERISA was passed and corporate officers became liable for the prudent management of the pension fund, pension management became a liability game as opposed to a risk and return game, which I get it. We're a country that focuses on the rule of law and that's a law. So good. We should solve for that. But what happened is we developed notions like tracking error, which is a crazy notion unless you're in the investment business. When you actually think about this, and if you're just a layman and you come in and say, well, wait a second, you're trying to get differentiated returns, but you're not allowed to behave differently than the index you're picking from, it doesn't make any sense, right? And yet, the industry keeps talking about that. So we want to be very different. So we can control the tracking error, if that's required, with our broad market exposure. But when we're paying someone active fees, we'd like them to be concentrated. So we're talking about portfolios that have 12 names in them, 15 names, and instead of 50 or 60 or 70 like most long-only guys have. And lots of the managers that we've picked have added a lot of value, but they do have a lot of tracking error. And the client has to know that, and we have to prepare our clients for that. And then it goes on from there. We believe in hedge funds. Well, let me take another step back. One of the things, if you think about uh, cost control, pretty good data out there that long, short managers, and I'm sure you know this, are good at picking stocks. Not as good at shorting stocks on average. Some are good, but not as good on average. And from our standpoint as a CIO, the fees are high. So what if we could pick their brains for their long only, forget about their shorts, and pay them a lower fee? So... That's a 13F strategy, right? Which a lot of people have been using for a long time and we have our own version of that. And so that's another way. And we're able to do that at a very low fee. We think that's another way to add value. It tends to be more constant. It's not as concentrated, but we like that. If you dive into that 13F strategy, how do you manage the external relationship with the internal trading of 13Fs? What we are focused on is that these tend to be crowded trades. So we've got some overlays on there to watch, you know, against the downside of everybody heading for the exit at the same time. And do you do it manager by manager or do you go use like the Goldman? Uh, no, we look manager by manager. Index? Yeah. Okay. Do you tend to do it with the managers you have money with or do you do it with managers you like but don't have money with? 
little of each. Depends on the publicly available information. And a lot of times we may not have money with a manager that we think is well-suited for the 13F strategy, but it's public information. On the public equity side, so we start with the index, you get to factors, a little enhancement to 13Fs, active manager cheaply. What's the vision going forward for public equities? Well, I do think that the combination of enhanced indexing, 13F, and concentrated long only are all alpha strategies. Where we have differed over the years is we spend more time on manager skill and a little less time on dynamically shifting allocations. So the evidence is that, in our opinion, is that unless they're very strong signals, this tactical asset allocation stuff is very hard to add value on. So we do not want to abandon it because it's critical for risk management. And there are times when you have a strong signal. So we're watching it all the time, but our day-to-day experience is that that is more stable and we're spending much more time finding skill. Do you also extend that internationally? You know, 13F is a U.S. phenomenon. Right. We have not yet. So how do you tackle the international public markets? Well, we're still long only there. And well, enhanced indexing and long only and concentrated, but not 13F. So everything we can do. You know, what I would say to you, Ted, is that it's all coming. You know, this, if I see this, we've been in business our 31st year. And every year, we're getting better. Every year, we get more access. Every year, we push the envelope a little bit while the market is changing around us. So when you started 30 years ago, or when I started 25 years ago, the number of concentrated long-only managers was pretty limited. Mm -hmm. There are a lot more of them today. Mm -hmm. How do you and your team do the work to decide among the universe of concentrated long-only managers, which ones fit for you in your portfolios? It's a combination of quantitative and qualitative. And what we're trying to do is find idiosyncratic risk. In other words, risk that we cannot explain away. And we've got all lots of quantitative tools to help us do that. But Dan McCollum, who joined us from Brown University quite a while ago, leads the alternatives team. And a fellow named Matt Mead leads our manager selection in both hedge and long-only. And very much focused on this notion of where's the idiosyncratic return. And the track record, you know, it's funny because we used to always say 30 years ago, people, process, portfolio, performance. That's still true. What tools do you have to figure out what the portfolio is really giving you? And how much of that return is structure, philosophy, execution, luck? And are there any particular favorite either tools or analytical metrics that you use with the team that kind of gives you that little sense on the quantitative side that this is a manager we want to dive into? The manager we dive into question is easier for me to answer than the actual tools. That's a podcast you need to have Matt Mead on because of the tools he's actually using. But it is that, first of all, you know this very well, that that there's a network of leading managers and thinkers. And if one of those managers who you've have a great regard for because they've earned it over the years, says, this is a manager you should look at. And the returns reinforce that, that the pattern of returns are unusual and seem to be very interesting. That's worth diving into. Now, the tools that we're actually going to use to cut it more finely are Matt's area of expertise. So let's move past public equities. Private equity has been a big driver of returns, broadly defined, the buyout world, venture world. How have you approached that area of the markets? So when you think about what we do, our business concept is to take the indisputable advantages of a multi-billion dollar independent office and deliver it to a college with a $200 million endowment. That's what we do. And so there are a lot of them. So really, the value added is not only to have a great program, but to get that great program on site so that the committee understands what you're doing, the human dimension of educating, staying with the program, and so forth. So when we look at private equity, we have to have a program, not a deal. So what we want to do, and I think of this, we talked earlier about enhanced indexing and so forth, and I think of it like a layer cake. And each layer has a layer of icing on it. And the alpha, the, you know, the manager skill is the icing. So the bottom layer has a little bit. You know, if we can consistently add 25 to 50 basis points over broad market exposure, that's great. But as you get up the cake, the icing gets thicker. So when we think at the very top, we're thinking about illiquid assets, 10 to 12-year lockups, and that's a big, thick icing on the top. There's lots of alpha there, lots of manager value added because it's an illiquid market, it's idiosyncratic, it takes special skill, 
It's lots of reasons that that is both rich and repeatable, you know, that there's a persistence among those certain managers. On top of that is when I think about this visual of the layer cake is sprinkles. Now, the sprinkles are either co-investment or they're deals that the client saw. And, you know, whether if it's a family who made a lot of money in stainless steel, they have a an opportunity that they understand and they want to bring that in and that's great. But those are in a sense the sprinkles on top of the icing on top of the layer cake. And what we find is that sometimes people will sell a business and be very motivated by going out and looking for deals and they might do a deal once in a while but it's not a layer of icing on top of the cake. You know we really want to have both of those things. So it's programmatic. That's a long way for me to say that my look at private equity and hedge and special opportunities which is sort of private credit is programmatic. So we want to have every 12 to 18 months a multi-manager pool we assemble so that our clients can have exposure to that important asset class. How do you think about venture capital when you have both a large pool and a pool that could be growing over time? Well, we look at various managers, all of whom we're always trying to get, as you know, private equity, including venture, is a lot of elbow grease on understanding what they're doing, but it's also a lot of access. You got to really work on your access. And we're doing due diligence while we're getting access so that when this hard to get access to fund says, we've got an opening, we're ready to go. We don't want to say, well, we'd love to join you, but now we have to do our due diligence. So we're really doing a lot of due diligence prior to that while we're working to get in. So when we think of venture, we have small firms and we have larger firms that we invest in. So, and so far, capacity has not been an issue. Sort of walk through a little bit of kind of the structure and philosophy and a little bit of the execution of how do you do. How does it actually work on the inside? Like, how do you make decisions with your team? Our philosophy is that we want to maximize breadth and we want to always find as much value add as we can. You know, alpha is magic. You know, if we can find it's valuable, scarce, and fleeting. So we're always looking for alpha. And we spend a tremendous amount of time looking for that. So if we find alpha that we all believe in, then we're going to find a spot for it, right? Because that's like magic sauce, right? We would not walk away from it. We're looking for strong signals in the rest of the portfolio. So we set up this diversified program. It's custom allocated for the client. I blew by that, but there's a tremendous amount of insight. If you think about going back to a medical metaphor, if I have better diagnosis, I'm likely to have a better outcome. So, for example, we spend a lot of time with colleges figuring out what their real illiquidity tolerance is. A lot of times when you look at a $200 million endowment, there's not a lot of finance analysis going on. The CFO is more of a COO, and he's very busy with making sure the dorms are working and not really thinking about cash management. So our expertise, we can go in and show why they have more illiquidity tolerance than they thought they did. Because there's a huge give up. If you're too liquid, you're giving up a lot of return. So that's important. So a lot of planning, we think about three-dimensional risk management, operating risk, financial risk, investment risk, and how do you put those all together? And then we put together an allocation that fits for that. And then we're looking every day to find dislocations and to watch out for risk and to find managers that have special skill. As a firm, you serve as the outsourced CIO for all of these clients. And there's a lot of clients. So how do you break up the responsibilities of who is that outsourced CIO for each client? If you think about what an internal CIO does, they have to understand the school, understand their operating financial risk, and they have to understand the committee. There's a difference between ability to take risk and a willingness to take risk. And a lot of that is education. So that's one part. That's a big part of what they do, managing meetings, managing expectations, meeting with new committee members to bring them on board. Then there's the investment part, right, which is meeting with managers, thinking about allocation, risk management, quantitative analysis, all that stuff. We, in a sense, separate those two. So the investment part is done by our strategy group, and the application is done by our portfolio management group. So every client has an investment officer and a portfolio manager. And the two of them are managing that client relationship. One is a little bit more human orientation, and the other is a little more technical. And so the portfolio manager's job, and they sit right next to the strategy group, is to take those best ideas from strategy and apply them to this particular client. So what happens is if we're overweight emerging markets, which we happen to be today, 
every client we have is overweight emerging markets. One, that might mean 15 above 10, five points over 10. Another might mean five over two. I mean, it just depends on the client. But we're all overweight. So strategy decides to overweight, and the portfolio manager applies it. And is the manager research part on the strategy side? On the strategy side. Okay, so it's sort of that core investment. Yeah, another way to think of it, Ted, is modules. So when you think about investing, there's two issues. There's customization, flexibility, and then there's investment returns. So in a perfect world, you'd have one pool. And you could do all kinds of things and overlays and everything. But there's an implementation challenge when you have thousands of accounts, which is what we have. So how do you find enough customization and yet have enough pooling that the strategy group can make it hum. So they can make the return hum while the portfolio managers and the investment officers have the ability to customize. And we've solved that with a notion of modules. Another way to think about this is the most flexible approach as having a stockbroker. Stockbroker can do anything, right? Yeah. Performance stinks, right? <laughs> Over here, you can have the best return is one pool. Customization stinks. So what's the combination? What's the sweet spot? And we do this with modules. And the strategy group runs the modules. So emerging markets, equity is one module. Large growth stocks, one module, so forth. Does the strategy group come up with a model asset allocation that the clients at least start with? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Well, today it's pretty neutral. In other words, U.S., non-U.S. is overweight emerging markets. And U.S. and equities versus bonds is pretty neutral. So we're short duration. But in other words, if your strategic allocation was... 60% 60% equities, 40% debt with a range of 55 to 65, we're at 60. Because we think there's enough push and pull in the world today that we're just neutral. So implied in the difference between neutral and the actual numbers, um, inferring that different clients might have, one might have a 70-30 mix, one might have a 90-10 mix. And so the strategy group kind of has these buckets and then they apply them with some kind of rule Well, for example, if your portfolio was 70-30 with a range of 65 to 75, and mine was 60-40, with, and we were neutral, you'd be at 70 and I'd be at 60. So it allows us to give our best ideas in a custom way. And once again, if we're overweight emerging markets, everybody's overweight emerging markets. So we don't want to have portfolio manager-specific solutions. We want to have our best ideas in every portfolio. And if we're wrong, that's the nature of the game. You know, you, you are wrong. But I don't want to be right and have a portfolio not have it. I want every client to have our best idea. Are there levers I'm missing? So there's the the stock bond lever. There's the geographic lever. There's public, private. Active, passive. Every dimension is a lever. And so the managers that are selected for the large growth pool, there might be two active managers and an overlay strategy and some sort of an enhanced index fund in that solution. Every one of our clients is getting that same. Can they get a piece of that piece solution? Of that. The only other thing would be that there is a customization factor. So, for example, if we take over an endowment and a large donor has a large growth stock manager, a large growth stock manager who has done well is also very important to the institution, then we will work around that. Build around person. it, yeah. It's also true with a family. They may have a trust at a bank, and we'll go to the bank and say, what do you do best? We go through analysis and say, could you focus on X? Because we think that's where they're going to hurt us least. And then we will complement that with the rest of the portfolio. We try to do it, Ted, just as if we were internal. And if we were hired to be internal, that's what we would do. So we try to make it. It sounds like it's this marriage of customization on the asset allocation side and then pools in the implementation. Right. You just carve up different pools and different asset classes. That's right. Now, that is also true. Our largest account today is about a billion dollars. And when it gets large, we can do more direct investing. So we're really indifferent. We make no money on the pools. We are conflict-free in the sense that all we have is an asset AUM fee, and it doesn't vary with the asset allocation. So if somebody's got 30% in private equity or five, our fee is the same. It's just on the total pool. So if we can do it without a pool, we're happy to do that. What have you learned in the evolution of your due diligence process? Well, a lot less alpha out there than people would like you to believe. That's one. This notion of structure, people process, portfolio performance, structure, culture, philosophy, execution, how do you use that to try and find what is durable and what is fleeting? And records change, and environments change, and the manager is going to do different things in different environments. So I think it's more subtleties other than the fact that we redefine alpha as misunderstood beta like every quarter. 
That's sort of the story of asset management progress if you are a user, if you're a CIO. What's been the hardest investment decision that you've had to make in the last couple of years? Well, I don't know about a couple of years. I was going to say to reinvest in January of 2009 to re-risk. That was tough. But it, in retrospect, it doesn't seem tough because it worked. But at the time, it was tough. And you remember, the market didn't turn until March. In the last couple of years, I think we've been doing more of the same, just constantly trying to improve things. It's been a fun period the last two years because we're finding more and more managers with alpha. Our team was strong two years ago, but it's even stronger today. So we're seeing great managers and and great techniques. I feel like we have not had any very difficult decisions over the last two years from an investment standpoint. So let's walk through some of those tilts. You mentioned emerging markets overweight. What is it that drives you to overweight emerging markets today? Yeah, it's a couple of things. One is that it's such a small portion of world market cap and it's getting bigger. So our notion is it might be, who knows, it might be a third of world market cap in 10 years. If that's true, we don't want to be too cute. You know, we want to just be there in, in something that's meaningful. And if you look at uh, emerging markets as about 10% of world market cap, and then this is a portion of that, a third to a half, you're really not getting a lot of China exposure when you just have an at-weight emerging markets portfolio. So that's one thing. And the second thing is simply the uh, earnings yield. From a valuation standpoint, it's more attractive. So that's really it. How about elsewhere? You know, I think of Europe as sort of a proxy for Asia because all the growth, I was talking to a fellow today saying that he was just got back from Germany and all the industrial companies over there are waiting for the China trade deal to happen so that they can trade into China. So if we get a deal done, if there's a trade deal done with China, Europe will pick up based on their business with Asia. But it's a question of the United States today versus Europe is we are more expensive than they, but there's a reason for it. And so we feel kind of neutral on that. So there are not a lot of beta shifts going on in our allocation today because nothing's at an extreme. I was talking this morning about the Fed's mandate is to have low inflation and full employment. Well, guess what? That's where we are. So what if they sort of stay still here and we have a long period of slow but positive economic growth? But we're in this phase right now where, you know, if you think about economic conditions, you have recovery, which we had in the beginning of the decade, you know, right after the crisis. Then you have acceleration, which went for a long time. And now we're in slowdown. And the next would be, you know, retrenchment. So recession, we don't see that in sight. But this section, this part of the cycle, I hate to use the word cycle because I think the world's much less cyclical than it used to be. But this part of the economic condition that is slowdown is not very directional. And it's, the world's kind of fairly valued right now. And so we expect quite a bit of volatility here where because every time good news comes out, people are going to say, oh, we're accelerating again. And when bad news comes out, it says, oh, my goodness, we're retrenching. And actually, this period could go on for a long time. The Great Recession was very bad, and it was almost a lot worse. So when you think about how close we came to depression, to really the whole thing falling apart, and how long did it take to recover from the Great Depression? World War II really ended the Great Depression. So this is a long, drawn-out process. We've had a long recovery. We could have a long kind of slowdown period here where we're still making money in stocks. I keep saying this, but I, logic tells me that this is the time when people who know which stocks are going to surprise on the earnings side are going to make money. And it's not just a risk-on, risk-off world. We're more neutral, and it seems like expertise is going to matter more. If you think about the risk side, and you articulated earlier, wanting to be sensitive to bubbles, let me throw out a few things that lots of people talk about as possibly bubbles, their own opinion. So the first is the private equity world, particularly buyouts, just based on, say, EBITDA multiples being maybe twice what they were 10 or 20 years ago. It's true. We've got to be careful. I would say this, that our expected return for private equity is about 400 basis points over the long-term expected return of the public markets. So 10 real. And that's a net. That's a net number. I think of it as 500 over the expected return of the portfolio because we have some bonds in the portfolio. So we're not trying to get, we underwrite to high numbers, but if we get up a 10 net, and that's real, okay, that's happy, right? That's good. So 12 nominal. And it's always relative. So unless it really bursts and you lose money, which doesn't seem likely to me, 
everything's overpriced and underpriced kind of at the same time, and it's a rank order decision. Do I still think that the managers we're engaging, and that's a key concept, this isn't private equity on average, you know, there's a huge spread, and everybody, you know, it's like Wobegon children are above average, so everybody believes they're in the above average managers, but we certainly do. And so do I think that we can still get 400 basis points over the public markets? I think the answer is yes. But you got to be careful. How do you think about public debt, U.S. government debt, Japanese government debt, building debt in China? Well, I like to think more about debt coverage than debt. And right now we see the 10-year Treasury below 250. So there's something secular going on in the world. The central banks seem to be pretty permissive because certainly the Fed could push up the 10-year Treasury any day they want by flooding the market with their 10-year Treasury inventory. So they're not doing that. And left to their own devices, the 10-year Treasury is stubbornly low in yield, which indicates something. And it's unusual. And my guess is it's sort of the thing that everybody else is talking about, which is the deflationary pressure from digital and that we're still in the middle of that. It's still happening. So what happens if we have this long, drawn-out period of low interest rates and that the risk is really deflation, not inflation, and we have an accommodative central banking system worldwide? I say it's equity. In other words, equities are the place to be because low interest rates are good for borrowers and bad for lenders, and so equities are borrowers. So we like to focus on the debt coverage ratio rather than the debt itself. And how about credit spreads? First of all, I think that's a yield hog problem. You know, everybody's desperate for yield, and so they're not paying attention to risk. So we're not very high on credit right now. And, we're, you know, fixed income-wise in general, we're pretty conservative. We are finding interesting things in private credit, and that's where we would prefer to go. Rather than taking a higher risk in public markets, where we think the opportunity has been bid away, we want to look for private credit. All right, so if we're sitting down here two or three years from now, and now you've had two or three more years of innovation on your process, what are the things that you're focused on with your team now to continue to grow and improve what you're doing for your clients? Well, a lot of it is more the same. And so better access, how do we have better weighting systems within the broad market exposure that are more effective? How do we educate our clients? This is the one I always want to emphasize. It's not just about investing. It's about getting the clients to understand what real investing looks like and getting these best practices into their portfolio. For example, a client will say, look, I've got a 5% required spending policy and so on and so forth, but I'm conservative. How do I get a higher expected return? We say, well, let's think about capturing some illiquidity premium. Well, that's frightening to people, but there's only so many moving parts that you can have. And so a lot of it is getting it into the client's system. And I believe that we are going to continue. Ranji Nagaswamy, who's our CEO, and I spend a lot of time on what we call governance alpha. You know, so governance alpha is everybody's had lots of decades of concentrating on why the small cap manager ought to beat the benchmark by 50 basis points. And yet a lot of times the governance decisions that are coming out of the committees are destroying massive amounts of, of value, and no one's ever held accountable for that. So we really want to talk about best practice on governance. This is a hot topic for me because, in a way, the CIO function changes the fiduciary relationship between the owner of capital and the manager of capital. So the whole point of having an internal office is that you have somebody who works for you, who isn't selling you a product, who is sophisticated and has massive purchasing power, who is working hard every day to advocate your interests only in the marketplace. So when you do that, the relationship, which historically has been buyer beware with Wall Street, is no longer buyer beware. It's much more of an advise and consent. It's like you go to the Mayo Clinic, you know, for your wellness, and they say, look, we looked at your fact pattern. Here's what we recommend. Most people don't argue with them. You know, they say, oh, I get it. (laughs) You know, you're the Mayo Clinic, and you guys are all doctors, and you're conflict-free, and, you know, this whole concept. So that's how we see this relationship moving. And we're going to continue to press on that. We think it's revolutionary, actually. We think the whole OCIO concept has been underappreciated by Wall Street because the big firms who are getting into the space see it as a distribution arm. You know, it's a label. They want to get more assets. Good. But we see it as actually this sea change in fiduciary governance. So that's going to be a lot of it. It's not just going to be the next investment technique. The one that intrigues me as an investment technique, which is pretty out there, 
is leverage at the fund level, because you and I know that that's just another thing. And if you could flatten out the efficient frontier, not flatten it, but not compromise on its promise, that would be a good thing. 25, 30 years ago, there were a lot of people who didn't understand total return, and they only wanted to spend income in the portfolio. And the moral issue was, you don't eat the goose, right? There's the goose and there's the golden egg. So we had to educate our clients to say, look, the goose is the corpus plus inflation. Everything else is golden egg, whether it's income or appreciation. So that took a while, but people got it. Now today, you hardly hear anybody saying we only spend income. I just wonder if this notion that leverage is a taboo might someday be overcome. Have you started having those conversations with certain clients? Yeah, it's very early. I mean, Harvard did that yeah. a long time ago. It was 5% levered, and then post-crisis, yeah. they got rid of it. It is not novel, but it's novel with our client base. Yeah. And that's where we spend all our time. How do we bring cutting-edge science? And I don't mean frontier, you know, out there, uh, the ragged edge of science, but proven best practices to the $200 million college endowment. So the thing I always struggled with, with leverage in that context, is that in theory, if you go over a multi-year, even multi-decade horizon, you want to push the envelope hardest when valuations are cheapest. Right. Now, no one thinks valuations are particularly cheap. And how do you distinguish whether a conservative or appropriate amount of leverage is the right thing for the long term? And even if that's the case, is now the right time to start doing it? Well, guess what? Using leverage is its own skill. I mean, I, I don't want to act like that's easy. You just put 5% on and leave it. That's not my point at all. People would poo-poo hedge fund guys say, well, they're just long short with leverage. And I'm like, well, yeah, but knowing how to use the leverage is its own skill. So I don't want to pretend that it's easy, but I think it's an interesting notion. Of, there could be another innovation. Well, John, let's turn to some closing questions. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Well, I was raised around horses. So I think riding a horse raises a man's perspective. And they always say that the outside of a horse is good for the inside of a man. So I love horses. I love outdoorsy stuff. I was a Boy Scout growing up. That was a tremendously meaningful thing for me. And fishing, bird hunting in particular, fly fishing. I don't want to say fly fishing like exclusive. I like fishing, period. If you can do fly fishing, it's even more fun because it's just a fun thing. And, and trout live in beautiful places. So, you know, in the rush of the water and it's mesmerizing and it distracts you from thinking about things like investments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your biggest pet peeve? It relates to this notion of misapplying ERISA rules, that best practices are things like tracking error and quarterly performance and the nine box framing of money managers. I mean, this is the thing that is fascinating to me. Charlie Ellis, you know, has written about you sort of can't win the game. And you should just index because you can't win the game. Well, I agree because the game is a game that is defined as a game that you can't win. So this notion of saying, I'm not going to differ from the benchmark, and yet I'm going to outperform is nonsensical. But that's what best practices have told us, that this ERISA rules and the pension consulting business has said, we're going to put a manager in this box and a manager in this box. And each one of those managers is somehow going to outperform their box even though they're not allowed to have tracking error. And in the end, we are going to minimize liability. And when you think about it, it is largely a CYA exercise. So it's set up so that if they get sued by the Department of Labor, they've got this defense. And I'm not criticizing that defense. What I'm criticizing is misapplying it into family and endowment management, where we should like tracking error. We should think about what you need to do to outperform, not shy away from it. I guess that's my biggest pet peeve, is best practices that are actually destroying value. What reading do you almost never miss? You know, it's funny. I'm sorry to be so old-fashioned, but I read the Wall Street Journal every day. I still read it in hard copy, which is amazing. That's the one they're still printing? I knew there was one <laughs> copy left that comes out every that's day. That's the one. <laughs> I met a guy who was like the editor, and he said, we should send you a prize. You're the only one left. Um, <laughs> but I do read that every day. I read Barron's on the weekends, so it's pretty old-fashioned. But then I'm looking for, I'm really being fed a lot of opportunities by my strategy group and by friends and by money managers. That's the periodicals I read. I do read The Economist because I just find it, I make a point of reading The Economist and listening to the BBC just to make sure that I'm thinking that I'm not too chauvinistic about my worldview. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? 
the self-confidence you can do anything and the high personal standards, integrity. So I'd say those are the two. And just their love. I was raised in a small town, and I really felt like I had an idyllic childhood. It wasn't that easy, but that was part of the idyllic. And related to that is one of my daughters said when they were young to my wife, said something about something wasn't fair. And she turned to them and said, let me tell you something, young lady. <laughs> you were born in the United States of America to two parents who love each other and love you. You're so far ahead on fair, I don't ever want to hear that word again. You know? <laughs> so fair is kind of a four-letter word in our family, and I feel that way about myself. And they certainly made me feel that way, and the commitment they had to me, which I have made to my children, I think is probably the, the most important thing they left me with. All right, John, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? I would say it's a notion of unintended consequences, that every cloud has a silver lining. And every silver lining has a cloud. And I said that to someone one time, and they said, that's the most pessimistic. I said, no, it's just I want to understand what it is. Calvin Coolidge was a person as president who almost tried not to pass laws because he thought that the unintended consequences would far outweigh what they were trying to accomplish. So I think that's this, this notion, the unintended consequences, which then flows into the hidden risks, the hidden correlations. How is the whole thing related in this notion of trade-offs? You should be on the lookout for them at all times. John, thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. 